It's Meet the Writers on BarnesandNoble.com. I'm Steve Bertrand. Jody Pico has a plan. She wants to confront you with some of life's toughest questions, not in a newspaper or in a magazine, but in fiction, in a novel. And she's done it again with Handle with Care. Jody Pico, welcome. Thank you. So tell me about this idea of confronting your reader and the idea of maybe some of these questions are easier studied in fiction. I'd love to say I invented it, but I'd be totally lying. Um, I think the idea of moral and ethical fiction really began a long time ago. And you look at someone like Austin or Dickens, and sure. they were popular commercial writers of their time who would get readers hooked on character and plot. And then after the last page is turned, the reader winds up thinking about some bigger issues. And, and I do think that it's a lot easier to address those issues in fiction sometimes. They give you almost a little shoehorn so that you can start talking about them. Do you think that your readers are drawn to you because of the stories or because of the issues? I think it's the stories. Yeah, I mean, I really anything. don't think anyone ever walks into a bookstore and says, can I have the latest novel about the sexual molestation of children by priests? You know, I mean, they're tough issues. But um, I think that the way they're written in, in the, the eyes and the ears and the voices of real families, you can relate to them. And so they don't seem quite so far out when you pick up the book. I suppose that was a bit of an odd question because obviously it's the stories, but it is a particular type of fiction, too, that I think people are drawn to. Yeah, and, you know, it's funny. I don't think people have been drawn to it the whole time I've been writing. I, I really had to develop a fan base over mm. almost 20 years now of writing fiction, but I think that uh, the stories kept people coming back, and, and they tell two friends, you know, oh, I read this book, and it's not like anything I've ever read before, and it was great. You should read it. Now, there's a story about, was an economic downturn led to your writing career? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, actually. I mean, since Gosh. we're in the midst of one I now? know. It's like we've come full circle, huh? Um, I actually was working on Wall Street in 1987 when the stock market crashed. I don't know what I was doing there. I can't even balance my checkbook. But I was working at Solomon Brothers, and I knew I was going to get a great severance package, and I did. And uh, I moved to Massachusetts, where the guy I was dating was living. Good move. I married him. Turned and, out to work out yeah. pretty well. <laughs> and I had a, a bunch of jobs over a two-year period. Um, I worked as a textbook editor at uh, an advertising agency writing copy. I taught creative writing at a private school and got a master's at Harvard and taught eighth grade English at a public school, got married, got pregnant, and that whole time I was writing. And it was during that time that I got an agent and she wound up selling my first novel just around the time my first son was born. Not bad timing. Yeah, it worked out very well. Uh, and also, writers, they say, in order to write their stories and tell stories, need to have suffered <laughs> during their childhood or their adulthood and what's with you I don't know I had this really happy life when I was right. a kid and and now I have this incredibly charmed life and I have great kids I have this really handsome terrific husband and you know I really I'm lucky I'm one of the really really lucky ones but I think that I couldn't write what I write about if I didn't have that safety net you know, I can write about these tragic situations, these families that are falling apart, these horrible medical situations and, and bad things that happen to children, because at the end of the day, I get to go downstairs and be normal. So if you were in a rough spot, your fiction might be different. Yeah, yeah. I think it would be totally different. But there still would be fiction. I think so. I, mean, I you, you, know, couldn't, you couldn't not be a writer? No, I really believe that. I would be writing even if no one read anything that I wrote, but it's much more gratifying this when way. When they do. <laughs> yeah. I uh, talked a little bit about the stories. Tell me about your characters, because you said that your characters arrive to you whole. They complete. do. I always think of Athena springing out of Zeus's forehead, but um, I don't feel like I create character. I feel like they, they just arrive, and usually it's their voices. I can hear them. And um, I've always kind of thought that writing is a little like schizophrenia, except I get paid to hear the voices. And, and they talk to me. They have very uh, distinct likes and dislikes and problems and issues. And I feel like my job is just to sit down and write down what they're saying to me. I don't feel as if I have a hand in creating the characters because they arrive. What I do is give them a situation to walk around in, to pick up on their shoulders and to develop into a book. And so in Handle with Care is this character, Charlotte, right. who is the perfect sort of character to write, right? I mean, she has, she wants to do the right thing. Yeah, she's, she's what I like to call one of my blinder moms. You know, a mom who has blinders on, can't see the big picture, but is so totally convinced that she's doing the right thing for her child that she can't see all the wrong she's also doing. Mm -hmm. 
And in the wrong, I mean, there's this wrongful birth lawsuit, which I'd not heard about, but they exist, right. right? They do exist. In about half the states in America, if you wind up having a severely disabled child, you might be able to sue your obstetrician for wrongful birth with the implication that they should have told you in advance your child was going to be impaired. And then you stand up on the witness stand and you say, if I'd known this, I would have terminated the pregnancy. And many people get millions of dollars in payouts because of it. Now, the parents I met who have sued for wrongful birth None of them actually ever wanted to terminate a pregnancy. They love these kids, but it costs a lot to raise a disabled child in America, and insurance doesn't pay for it. And so there is that moment of drama, though, of actually saying, I wish my child had not been born. And there's a difference for me um, between having a, a mentally disabled child who doesn't understand what you're saying and having a child like Willow O'Keefe in the book who has severe physical disabilities, but mentally is a really smart cookie. Even ahead of the game. Exactly. You mentioned cookies. There are recipes in this book. <laughs> nice segue. <laughs> is this, is, have you done that before? No. With recipes. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that there's a language to the recipes. Right. Explain that. The recipes are all centered around a particular baking term, like, for example, weeping or hardball or... Um, uh, I'm blanking on some other ones. Um, but the idea is that that you are you're given a term that has a double entendre meaning. And where it's inserted in the text has to do with what's going on in the rest of the story. So, for example, at the hardball stage, you think about somebody playing hardball, not willing to give up in an argument. And um, the recipe is for a type of candy. And that's what the hardball stage is all about in candy making. However, it also happens to be a place in the text where Charlotte and Sean, her husband, are at loggerheads over this lawsuit. And one of them has to blink. You said it's the saddest book you've ever written. Yes. Yeah. Is it hard to write a sad I mean, is it hard for you emotionally to write a sad book? Yeah, it is. It's hard for me to write. It's not hard to write a sad book, but I think it's hard to write one that doesn't leave you with a little glimmer of hope. And this, to me, um, there's an irony at the end of this book, and that's what keeps it from being particularly hopeful. Let's it's talk, more like a cautionary tale. Let's talk gestation a little bit. Yeah. You said your first book came out when your first child was born, right? right? Mm -hmm. And you also say in interviews that it takes you nine months to write a book. Yeah, I'm What's very that brutal. about, <laughs> I know. Well, nowadays when I finish a book, my husband gets me a balloon that says congratulations on the new arrival and <laughs> ties it to uh, my chair. It's a novel, so. right? Yeah, yeah, I don't know why. I, I mean, I think it started off just taking me about nine months to research and do the first draft of a book. And now when I'm touring for about three months of the year, it just fits in very naturally. Into that the it schedule. just works. And yeah. you're, you're one of those writers who doesn't have a hard time. I mean, you've already got a couple... Yeah. Working and... I do. The 2010 book is at the publisher, and I'm doing the research now for 2011. It's, is it ever a struggle? Not yet. No. <laughs> um, Sister's Keeper? Yeah. It's coming out as a movie. It is. Yeah, June big 26th. controversy there, right? Well, you know, it's not so much a big controversy if you know the business. The ending's different. The ending is different in the movie, right. And, you know, if you sell the rights from a book to a movie, you have nothing to do with the movie. Sure. I think people are always really shocked to hear that they don't use the author as a resource, but that's the exception, not the rule. And, um, you know, although I really do feel that the ending uh, sort of gives you the whole message of that particular book... Um, it's disappointing that they changed it, but I'm really looking forward to judging the movie as a movie, as its own entity. Um, I know the acting is really good. I've seen some of it on set. I know that there's a lot in the script that is lifted directly from the book. So I think people who read the book will be pretty pleased with, you know, 95% of it. Who do you think will have a harder time with it, the book's creator or the book's readers? Uh, the book's readers. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I had to make peace with it. And it's going to be harder for the really diehard fans of the book. I love them all because they're so fiercely loyal to the story. But the best thing about a book-to-movie transition is that you can always come home from the theater and reread the book. I was going to say, and the good news is there'll be another one soon at the bookstore. Yeah, you know, it never changes. The book never changes. Jody Pico, nice to talk to you. Thank you. I'm Steve Bertrand. This is Meet the Writers on BarnesandNoble.com.